But thank you, Sylvia, for everything you've done and everything you continue to do. All right, so I'm already behind schedule. I apologize. But I would like to welcome Justice Brent Benjamin to the podium today. He is a sitting Supreme Court Justice for the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia. He's seen a lot of different animal cases that come before the bench, and he's going to talk to us a few minutes today about some of the things that he's seen, and I just want to give him a warm welcome. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, it's a pleasure to be with people who understand what showing cat pictures on a cell phone is all about. <laughs> and, uh, or dog pictures. Yeah. Um, um, no, thank you very much for the invitation to come and uh, share some time with you this morning. Can everybody in the back hear me all right? Um, you know, I've been on the court for 12 years, and we don't get a lot of animal law cases at the Supreme Court. Most of the matters involving the law and animal uh, issues are dealt with at the magistrate level, at the circuit court level, and sometimes in municipal courts. Um, so we don't have the opportunity to see that many cases. Now, I'm also a member of the Bar of, of Kentucky, and obviously with the horse racing over there, they have a whole other area that involves primarily livestock and horses. But for here, so much of the focus of what we've seen in recent years has dealt with uh, one specific statute. Uh, we've had three cases on it. And uh, the legislature's addition of, a di uh, of yet another st uh, statute. Uh, and they both deal with when uh, dogs can be destroyed uh, based upon complaints by individuals or based upon how they come up through the system. And the court has had to deal with both of those um, uh, issues and those statutes. Um, the last case I'll talk about very briefly, and I'm not going to go into a uh, line by line for two reasons. One, Saturday morning you don't want to hear all the, the legal <laughs> stuff, I'm sure. And two, I did promise to keep you on track. And as a judge or as a lawyer, I can take one case and we can talk about it for three hours. You don't want to do that. But um, the three cases I want to talk about, the third one, of course, is the one I'm sure many of you are more, most familiar with, uh, which I refer to simply as the Tinkerbell case. Uh, how many people have heard the Tinkerbell case? Okay. Um, it's not often that we uh, find out after we've issued a decision that uh, one of our cases had its own Facebook page, uh, which Tink did have. And by the way, I understand Tink's name's now being changed. For unfortunately, uh, for those, who, and I'll get to this in a second. But, uh, unfortunately, there's folks out there who make threats, and um, Tink was the subject of some of those threats. So for safety reasons, Tink has had to go into witness protection, so to speak. <laughs> um, the statute that I want to mention to you, and it's one that I think anybody who uh, is involved uh, with with uh, well with uh, uh, the issue of dogs and uh, uh, the so-called vicious type of dogs, uh, which is not necessarily a well-defined term, is a section called 192020 in the statute. Now it's added to that in 2014 was one 1920D, um, which modified it a little bit, and I think it was a response to a decision that we rendered back um, in 2012, which I wrote. Uh, in essence, what 192020 does is it provides uh, when a dog that is considered vicious or dangerous uh, can be destroyed, what proof is necessary and what was important for us, what kind of court that needs to be brought before. Um, the problem with it, it basically says, um, upon satisfactory proof before a circuit court or a magistrate that a dog is vicious, dangerous, or in the habit of biting or attacking other persons or other dogs or animals, the judge may authorize the humane, off or the humane officer to cause such a dog to be killed. Now the problem, of course, what we were confronted with when we got our first case, which was called Durham versus Jenkins, which 
as all of these cases have really bad facts because they only get to us when somebody gets hurt. And in this case, it's a two-year-old little girl. Mm. And she was very, very severely injured by, uh, by at least one, maybe two dogs. Um, the problem when we get a case like this as judges is that there's really no direction in the statute of what type of behavior by a dog constitutes dangerousness or viciousness. Um, the statute just does not talk about that. The statute does not talk about provocation. So as a judge, we're starting off wondering, what if it's a dog that's protecting, uh, that, that is maybe even trained to protect property uh, or individuals? What if it is a service dog that is protecting its owner? So these are all issues that we have to, to uh, uh, deal with. Now, the, the, the case, and uh, I'll just summarize it very quickly, uh, was of a family that went over to a, another family's house. Uh, they had a two-year-old two little girl with them. Sometime around 10 o'clock that night, the little girl wandered away into another part of um, the yard where there were two dogs. The dogs were chained. They had a run area. The dogs could did not, could not interact together, but they could come almost nose to nose if they needed to. But they were chained, um, and the little girl went back perhaps to play with them. Uh, the one dog grabbed the girl, did significant damage uh, physically to her. That dog was destroyed. Um, the second dog, there was a question whether or not that dog had actually been engaged in it or not. The, the, the testimony um, the testimony was was inconclusive, I think, from a standpoint of there were some that said yes, there were some that said no. The problem we had is law enforcement did not do a report. They, we did not have witness statements <coughs> from the time, uh, and they chose and the law the, the prosecutor chose not to prosecute. The family of the little girl brought an action before <coughs> a magistrate what's called civil action, not a criminal action, asking for the dog, the second dog, to be destroyed. The magistrate, relying on that statute, said that the dog should be destroyed. And the quick case that came up before us was whether or not a private person could use a criminal statute to act to seek the destruction of a dog uh, where it was not expressed in that statute that they could do that. In other words, is there an implied cause of action in a criminal statute for a private person to use that statute to have a dog destroyed? In approaching a case like this, it's very difficult because you can't get around the facts, but the law would seem to be very clear. It's a criminal statute. This is a matter for the prosecutor or the legislature or the prosecutor or the uh, police to involve themselves in, not a private cause of action. And in this case, the court on a four to one decision said, no, there is no private cause of action here. If the prosecutor wishes to go forward, that's fine. If law enforcement wants to take this forward, that's fine. But we can't, but absent the legislature saying that you can go forward as a private individual, you can't use a criminal statute to do this. And there was at that time no civil statute which permitted a private cause of action to seek the destruction of a dog. So that's where it, that's where it stood on that case. Um, why did the legislature get to that point? Well, we've watched a, a kind of an evolution of the legislature from the 1800s where dogs were considered almost akin to livestock to more of the today's perception that dogs are companions, they're members of the family, and dogs, and there's been an evolution in the law and for whatever reason, the legislature chose not to give to individuals that a power to use that statute. So, that, so that's how we decide that case. We also encourage the legislature that if the legislature wanted to create a remedy, a civil remedy, they could do so, which they did a couple years later. And what they did was they they came up, and this is something that um, I'm not. We have not had any cases on yet, but it's one that you need to, to be aware of. The first statutory section I said, 192020, is a criminal statute. 1920D, 1 to 3, is a civil statute. Slightly different standard of proof. The first one is beyond reasonable doubt. This one's a, little, a lot less. It's called 
clear and convincing. But um, in this case, there's two ways that a person can go before a magistrate and seek the destruction of a dog. Uh, the first one is to, uh, if you are the subject of an attack by a dog and you sustain over $2,000 in medical uh, costs, that is a threshold event. Or if you're attacked by a dog and that dog is in the prior 12 months attacked someone else and caused harm that requires medical attention, that can be a threshold event. Either one, you've got to have one or the other, and you have to have one other thing. The attack was unprovoked. And if you have both of those, you can go before a magistrate. The magistrate can, uh, if there's sufficient um, evidence, find that the dog is in the habit of biting and, and, and being vicious and can order the destruction of the dog. Now, what's been pointed out is uh, the $2,000 limit. We, we discussed this among lawyers yesterday. $2,000 limit, 10 years from now, is going to be maybe at the hospital the price of a, of, of a few aspirin. <laughs> um, so, so it seems a little bit arbitrary, but I think what, this, what the legislature was trying to do was to create some bright lines out there. And obviously, if it's arbitrary, my guess is it will come up before us at some point and we'll have to decide that case. But, in, but, but the legislature has now acted to provide a civil cause of action. The uh, final two cases that I wanted to mention that will kind of update you on where the, this issue is um, were two cases that uh, uh, also had very, very difficult fact patterns. The one was called the City of Bluefield. Um, anybody here from Bluefield area? Okay, you probably know the case I'm getting ready to talk about. Robinson versus City of Bluefield. The case in which the, there had been a complaint that had been, been registered, a um, officer from animal control went to the residence, uh, the dog um, ended up uh, biting him in the hands. There's a lot of fact, there was a lot of discussion as to the reason the dog did that. But in any event, um, the uh, animal control um, folks uh, took the dog and uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, through the litigation of the case, the dog was kept pretty much in solitary confinement, was not allowed to socialize, and that was a very difficult thing ultimately for the dog. But in this case, the city decided to go forward under the criminal statute seek the destruction of the dog. When I mentioned what the statute was before, I emphasized that the statute clearly says uh, that the case may be brought before a circuit court or magistrate court. And in this case, the city wanted to use a city ordinance to seek the destruction of the dog. We went through, and this was a 3-2 decision as uh, since 2013, the court changed a little bit. And the case, the cases dealing with this have now been three to two, so they're very, very close. Um, and it's been the same makeup on the court, so I don't know if that's a trend or not. Uh, but in this case, uh, we went through the history of the legislature looking at these types of statutes and the, and the, and the history of the legislature with respect to dogs especially. And we talked about the evolution and how the legislature has afforded more protection uh, over the years to dogs and considered them more, more as pets, so to speak. And in this case, the court on a three to two decision said, the legislature has clearly said that if a dog is going to be destroyed, we want that decision to be made by an elected judicial officer, not an appointed one. Municipal judges are appointed, not elected. Uh, we, the legislature very clearly said it's going to be done by a magistrate or a circuit judge. So we applied the law as it was written and we said that the city could not use a city ordinance to do that. That the legislature clearly occupied this area of the law and therefore the city could not go forward under its uh, ordinance. It could, if it wanted to, proceed in magistrate court. It, should, it did not do that by the point it got to us. But that's the decision. Now, the dissents disagreed. They were very strident, I think would be the polite word to use. 
Uh, they focused on the harm that was done to the officer um, and, uh, and just disagreed about whether the legislature intended something such as the destruction of a dog to be uh, limited to the magistrates and to um, circuit judges. When I looked at the case and I wrote a separate opinion and it became very clear to me that, um, and then this is what I wrote, that the legislature considered the destruction of a dog to be something that should be a matter of considerable discussion, consideration, and uh, therefore they wanted, uh, they, they had clearly decided they wanted elected judges, that those elected judges uh, have certain training, which is what magistrate is required to have, which is what certain judges are required to have. We have some great municipal judges in the state, but the requirements are different. And as I said, they're not elected judges. So uh, the, the legislature, I thought, was very clear on this. Obviously, the two dissenters uh, disagreed, and that is why we have five on the court. Um, but that's where that's, that, so at this point, with respect to the destruction of a dog, we've said that it has to be decided by a um, magistrate or a circuit judge. It has to proceed under this proceeding. It has to be uh, a criminal proceeding, or you have to go through that other statute and show one of those um, threshold events. The final case that we dealt with last, uh, last year, and this was a case that actually got considerable press. We, you know, when, when we decide cases, and since I've been on the Supreme Court, I've probably participated in somewhere between 10 and 15,000 cases. Um, there are some that stand out to you that you know are going to be cases that are, get discussed a lot. I have to say, I didn't think Tinkerbell's case was going to be one of those. Uh, there are some that deal with profound constitutional issues. But I think Tinkerbell's case, uh, which I authored last fall, or last year, was a case that touched the nerve of a lot of folks because um, the facts, while the child was injured, in this case there was a serious question whether the dog was even vicious or, or it was just playful. Sad case of, uh, again, families uh, coming together socially, uh, children involved, dog has been inside, the question is, is the dog, the dog was definitely a mix, whether it was a, what, what some people would call a pit bull or not, um, is another matter. Our decision in the case ultimately said that the term viciousness cannot be a, uh, well, that no breed, that viciousness is not breed specific. That's the holding of, that's the holding that I wrote. Viciousness is something that's specific to a dog. It is not something specific to a breed. The case, if you read it, stands also for the proposition that the court's really not sure what the ultimate definition of a pit bull is because a lot of people have different de definitions and certain uh, breeds are considered a pit bull and others aren't, as we found out. But in this case, um, a young boy was outside playing with others from the other family. The dog was inside. The dog was about a year and a half old, as I recall. Uh, playful. Everybody said this dog was very playful, uh, was very gregarious, that the dog slept with the children of the family, um, and the dog's of course, name was Tinkerbell, um, which I thought was also interesting because in the other cases, the dog's names have been Duke things like that. So this is Tinkerbell. <laughs> and and uh, Tink was inside and I think it was Grandma inadvertently left the door open. And Tink came running out and wanted to play. And Tink had a ball in the yard and Tink started playing with her ball. And the little boy decided he wanted to play too. And um, well let's put it this way. A, um, boys, little boys have hands. So when the ball goes up, they can reach. Dogs don't. They have paws. They don't have thumbs. And so dog, but dogs have mouths. So when dogs go up, they go up with their mouths first. And when dogs go up and boys go up together, they sometimes do this. And the, dog, the boy ended up getting bitten. The question, there's a serious question. Did the dog intend to bite the child, 
or was it inadvertent because the dog was going for the ball? And there was a serious question on that. And I don't think anybody ever thought that Tink was a dog that was going to go out and, and you know, rip apart people or anything like that. But there was a serious question as to whether or not this, this, that the criminal section should require that Tink be uh, euthanized. And the case came up before us. The court below had made the determination basically that Tink was a pit bull, that pit bulls are inherently dangerous, that that therefore constituted the basis upon which Tink should be destroyed and ordered the destruction of Tink. Um, the good part about this is that Tink uh, had the benefit of being, anybody from Cabell County here? Okay, the Humane Society over there, uh, the shelter, um, treated Tink very well, played with Tink, socialized. As I later found out, members of the media were going out and playing with Tink. Um, Tink was a very, uh, Tink, was a, T Tink was a dog that people liked to be around and, and um, I, I was told by one of the attorneys involved that had it not been that he already had two dogs, he would have adopted Tink ultimately. Uh, Tink was a gregarious, friendly dog, a little bit rambunctious, um, but, but nevertheless uh, it was a good thing that during the pendency of this case, uh, Tink was very well treated, so Tink didn't have any adjustment problems afterwards. The case came down to 3-2 decision. Very, very strongly worded dissents advocating that Tink should be euthanized. But as I said, on the 3-2 decision, the court said you cannot simply determine by a breed that a given dog is vicious for purposes of destruction. And um, when we rendered the decision, we knew that obviously the people that were involved in the case would have a great interest in that. And we knew that. That's the case for every case we decide. But I have to be honest, when my law clerk came in, who lives in Huntington, and said, Justice, did you know that your decision just made Facebook? And I said, um, no. And so she pulled it up, and I think by that point there were already over a thousand likes on there, which, got to be honest, is nice when you get a like. <laughs> because in my line of work, 50% of the people that leave the court do not like you. Um, um, but but uh, it was interesting to see, and, and sometimes when we, we try to isolate ourselves when we're deciding cases, because our job is to decide cases based on the law and not emotion. Um, and I, and certainly I knew that there would be some emotion in this case. I'd never ever uh, guessed that, maybe I should have, that the Tinkerbell case would generate the emotion that it did. And not all the emotion was good. Um, a lot of people were upset with the decision. And as I alluded to earlier, um, while I may jokingly say that Tink's had to go into witness protection, the reality is Tink got death threats mm. afterwards. And um, ultimately, Tink's name has been changed uh, and it's because people were threatening to kill Tink. Mm. And that's an unfortunate thing. Um, but that gives you some idea, and I did promise to make sure we would stay on uh, track, so I, I see it's 9 o'clock. But I hope that gives you a little bit of flavor for, at least in the area of destruction of dogs, where the court is. We don't handle that many <coughs> cases dealing with uh, animals at our level. But for whatever reason, in just the last few years, we've had three specific cases hmm. dealing with the destruction of dogs, and ultimately, the, where the law is, at least from our perspective, is it's got to be a criminal proceeding or you've got to go into the new civil statute. It has to be through a magistrate court or through a, crim or a, a circuit court and that you cannot just assume a dog is vicious because of its breed. You must actually prove that the dog was vicious. And I think that the latter holding would apply on the civil side too. You can't just assume that a dog by breed other than action is vicious. So that's where we're at. Whether we'll have more cases, I don't know uh, in, in the near future, but I, I think that uh, hopefully that gives you a little flavor. Uh, hate to start you off the morning with law, but thank you for your uh, uh, kind uh, attention. And it's always great to see other people that uh, 
as I said, understand when I show pictures of my cat. <laughs> Unfortunately, I travel to the extent that it's hard for me to have a dog. But, uh, uh, when I retire, that, that's when that happens, if the cat's allowed. Um, but, thank, but thank you so much for your attention. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. It sounds like you looked at the intent of Tink when you were deciding the case. Well, I, I think that had to be part of uh, part of the consideration of whether uh, Tink was vicious or not. And yes, I, th I think certainly it. After after Tink collided with the little boy, uh, I did leave one thing out, and I think it did. I, I well, I'm human. I can't say it didn't affect me a little bit. You know what Tink did after the. Collision? Licked him. Almost. Tink saw what happened, and Tink ran inside and hid under a table. Oh. So, so, yeah, I'm sorry, that does affect you a little bit. Uh, but the little boy is very hurt, it was hurt too. The boy, the boy is uh, apparently, from what I understand, recovered are fine, but, and the families have resolved all their civil disputes and so on. But yeah, I, obviously, the, the Tink's intent or what Tink did has to, at some point, be considered because if if, if there's going to be a determination of viciousness, fight or flight, he well, fly. <laughs> if, if if there's going to be viciousness, as we said, it can't be just assumed. Uh -huh. You do have to look at what the act was, and because the civil statute now does look at provocation, obviously, what was going on at the circumstances with why the dog did what the dog did is something that needs to be. Done is something that needs to be considered by the magistrate, the judge, or the justice. So, yeah. Did lack of parental control of the child come into the calculation? I think that in, dur during oral argument, there were counsel, in, in the case involving the two-year-old, certainly there was a discussion uh, during oral argument about, you know, the, where were the parents at 10 o'clock at night? Um, and that came out, but that didn't decide, that was not determinative at all in our decision about the destruction of a dog. That would be something that perhaps would be in a civil lawsuit, family to family, uh, for damages. That might be come up there. But with respect to the issue of viciousness, what if anything the parents did is not relevant? Thank you. Any other questions? You said three minutes left? Yeah. Okay, I put you three minutes ahead. <laughs> see, see, when lawyers th say things like brief, <laughs> they really are 40 pages long. <laughs> so, but thank you all very much. Have a great day and good morning. Thank you.